Well, my father was born in Sicily and my mother was born in North Queensland, but she comes from an Italian family. So I'm a product of um, pre-World War II immigration and post-World War II immigration. I suppose our childhood was very much defined by our Italian culture, more than anything by the Sicilian culture. I, you know, you can't really define aspects of being Italian without going into the dialect and the region and we were very much raised with that knowledge that our family came from Sicily. Every single Sunday we would have um, lunch together at my grandmother's house and that would have been you know close to you know 30 people but it was just normal. I was a very very I won't say reluctant reader I struggled as a reader as a child and um, when I was in first grade I, I didn't know how to read. My first grade teacher you know she was really dealing with the multicultural classroom and, and kids who came from non-English speaking backgrounds for the first time. And so my mother um, spent every afternoon for the next you know, five years that I was at that school helping my first grade teacher um, teach kids how to read. And so I always feel as if my love of reading and then my love of writing came from my mother's passion for reading. I spent you know, my teenage years reading so much and not once did I see a character who in any way reminded me of me. It was almost as if, you know, my culture, who we were as a family, my identity just existed within my family. It did not exist in the pages of a book. I went into writing, um, I would say, in a very unplanned way. I left school when I was 15 and it, my mother was very reluctant to let me do that but the one thing that she insisted on was that I um, I was too young for her in her opinion to go into the workforce so she insisted that I went to business college and the strangest thing that I can say about my early days as a writer is that I, I learned to type and in being able to learn to type, I could actually read my work back because I used to write stories and I could never read them back because my handwriting was so bad. So all of a sudden I was writing and I was able to read back what I had um, written. When I was 19, my sister and I went to um, overseas for the first time and we ended up in Sicily. And I was always told that if I went to Italy, I would understand where I came from. My sisters and I were the same. It wasn't that we were incredibly confused, but when you have an English-speaking mother, um, you, you weren't Italian enough for the Italian girls at school and you, were, you weren't Aussie enough for the Aussie girls. So we were kind of in between. And I remember everyone would say that, you know, when I got to Italy, everything would change and it, it didn't, except I got to talk to my great aunts and they told me the stories of the day, you know, they remembered so vividly the day that my grandmother and my father and, you know, his brothers and his sister, you know, got on that boat in the 1950s and they were still crying telling that story and this was in the 80s. And I just remember I came home and I said to my mother, I'm, I'm writing a book. And the one thing I was so sure of was that I wanted the book to really focus also on my grandfather's, you know, the, my grandfather who had come out in the 1920s. And sadly, you know, she came back from Queensland and she said, um, he's, he's got Alzheimer's and it's all gone. So as a result, I had to concentrate on my grandmother and that's why Looking Fowler Brundy is a story of three generations of women and not a story about a girl getting to know her culture through her grandfather. So it was a bit of a mishap, but you know, it was meant to be because I think that that three generations of, of women um, and, you know, worked so strongly for, um, for me because you know, I come from a world of girls. As much as I feel as if my first novel has dominated um, the conversations about my work and it's my most for me it's my most flawed piece of work um, but it did it did change my life and I remember when it came out I calculated that I knew maybe 200 people who lived in the world and I would think I thought 200 people will read this book and it was just pretty amazing when you know you'd open up a newspaper and there was a review or I remember you know, having, um, you know, the Sydney Morning Herald did a piece on me and there it was in the, on the second page. And, you know, all of a sudden, I was a bit of a wallflower and all of a sudden, you know, I was kind of put out there and people were talking about my work. And um, that novel um, won the Children's Book Council of the Year Award. Um, and then I wouldn't say that I didn't know what to do, but I didn't 
I didn't write another novel for another 11 years. And it's because I felt that so many people wanted the sequel, they, they wanted me to do it again. And I remember thinking, but I don't know how I did it in the first place. It was definitely written from the heart. And during that time, I was approached by a production company who was interested in it being a film. And that was in 1993, and the film didn't happen until 2000, and it just shows how long it takes for things to get off the ground. And during that time, they decided that um, they wanted me to write the script. And it was such a long process, but that novel and that film, for me, I can't choose you know, which one means more to me but they're two pieces of work that I'm so proud of. And I think the pride comes also from the fact that it brought so much pride to my family. Also the fact that, you know, we're, we're almost talking about 30 years later, and I just can't believe that, you know, teenagers relate to a girl who doesn't have a mobile phone or doesn't have social networking or anything like that, but they still very much relate to her. And I just think um, it's not the success that I'm proud of, it's the longevity as a result of um, you know, my novel being accepted by Penguin to be published, I remember thinking if I'm smart enough to write a novel, I'm smart enough to go to university and, and, um, and I decided when I was 25 that I was going to do teaching. I remember um, it was 2001 that um, I was working at an all boys school and you know, you're so aware of the fact that you are in a minority and I always thought that I wanted to write about it, but not from the point of view of a boy or a teacher. And I just did one of those what ifs, you know, what if girls came to this school in year 11 and 12. And so I started writing Saving Francesca. Once again, surprisingly enough, it just took off. And it was one of my first novels. Um, Ella Brundy got a bit of a, a tiny, tiny bit of attention in the US, but I remember you know, I was off to work one day and, and, you know, it was a crazy week at work and I hadn't looked, listened to my answering machine for, you know, four days. And I listened to it and it was my agent telling me that there was a bidding war in the US um, for Saving Francesca as a novel. It was the first time that I felt that, sh you know, someone I had created had this profile on the other side of the world. And, you know, one of my favourite stories to tell was that I was reading um, a scene from Saving Francesca in-house at the publishing company in New York and someone came up to me later and said it's so strange to hear Francesca read with an Australian accent and I told that story in Chicago because I had to go to Chicago as well and someone came up to me and they said oh no you know Francesca's a Chicago girl and I just loved this idea once again that this Italian girl you know from the inner west of Sydney had you know this universal appeal from Francesca on I just feel as if I've written probably a novel every couple of years and I tend not to write what people want me to write you know just when they really love the Italian girls in the suburbs I'll do something different and I'll get a bit of a backlash for it and then I'll get someone you know my third novel was that it was you know, I remember people, even a bookseller saying to me to my face, I don't like it, I loved your other two, and I was so crushed. Um, and then that particular book won a major award in the US, and you just think you've got to take your own path because if you're constantly, constantly going to be doing the same thing, you will get pigeonholed. And then my last adult novel, which is called The Place on Dalhousie, which is really set in Dalhousie Street, um, Haberfield, I was able to go back to my roots um, so it's almost like I was saying to people, let me do whatever I want to do, but I'm going to go back, you know. So um, I've really loved the freedom I've given myself and I've been very fortunate that my publishers have never said to me, this is what we want you to write, because I wouldn't have written it. I just, you know, I tend to do what I want to do and it works. Well, it was last year, my editor, um, you know, asked if I was interested in writing for a younger age group and I just thought, no, I cannot do that. And, you know, around the same time, my daughter's nine now, but she was struggling with her reading. She's a very reluctant reader. And I just really wanted to write something that she could relate to, that she'd be able to see herself. I remembered being that girl, you know, when I was 15. And um, so I wrote a story about a little girl called Zola, who's, you know, seven years old, who lives with her mum and lives with her nonna. And, it's, you know, in a way it's a bit sad because when I started writing those novels, my father was still alive and I had no, you know, we had no kind of um, suggestion that he wouldn't be around. And it's quite 
interesting that that novel um, is about grieving or not grieving but missing um, her nonno and then of course it happened so it's it's such an important I feel as if the series is in a way although my father and the grandfather's not in it there's the essence of him and um, I just like those layers that you're able to put into books because when you're writing for children you have to write really simple just so simple but it has to you know pack a punch it was a surprise for me that it it's taken off so well and that the you know the illustrations are so beautiful but every single novel I was probably silly enough to pitch you know what Zola did on Monday not realizing that I'd have to write another six books um, but every single situation in that book is pretty much a situation that we've experienced so it's great to be able to make that into a fun story and you know even Saturday which hasn't come out yet I just could not resist, you know, Tomato Day. So, you know, on Saturday, there's mayhem on Tomato Day. I think that what makes me feel Italian is exactly what made me feel Italian when I was a child, and that was community. And I just love the fact that, you know, we don't have to talk about being Italian every day because being Italian is just part of our everyday life. Buonasera, salute.